It is now my distinct pleasure to welcome our Tweedshire Australia Day Ambassador. The Tweed is home to so many remarkable people with their own unique personal stories to tell. It's also home to some wonderful storytellers, including one of the nation's most distinguished, who we are so lucky to have as our Australia Day Ambassador this year. Mr Ian Finlay is an award-winning journalist, author and humanitarian. He spent more than 50 years in the media as a reporter, producer, director and host of national and international radio and television programs and documentaries, including This Day Tonight and the groundbreaking science and technology series Beyond 2000. A Timbalgan resident for the past 15 years, Mr Finlay has acclaimed foreign was an acclaimed foreign, cor foreign cor correspondent and has travelled and worked on every continent with a particular interest in Southeast Asia. More recently, Mr Finlay and his wife Trish Clark, who is also with us here today, have been central to humanitarian and education initiatives in Asia, including building a school for one of the villages, with funds partly raised from the Tweed. Please welcome your Tweed Ambassador, Mr Ian Finlay, for his Australia Day address. Um, thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Hello. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today on Australia Day. Generally, what speakers do is acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, which is what Katie has just done and then move on to the main speech, which is what I'm going to do. But I'd like to say just a little bit more about these original owners, uh, rather than just a passing reference, because for many Indigenous people, Australia Day is not a cause for celebration. For them, it's Invasion Day, um, the day they started to lose their country. And though, although I'm personally very much in favour of and a supporter of Australia Day as a strong unifying element in our society, it's worthwhile taking on board the fact that Aboriginal people were living in the Tweed, as Katie said, thousands of years ago, but it's 10,000 years at least, and they've carbon dated sites on Stradbrook Island to 20,000 years ago. That's 15,000 years before the pyramids were built. So. We've got to accept that Indigenous Australians might have a very different view of this state. And if you'd like to sort of pick up a bit more and understand this all a bit more, I can't recommend a book more highly than Stan Grant's new book called Talking to My Country. And I can also give some contacts and references afterwards if you are really interested. Anyway, Australia Day and what it means to me, and that's what I was asked to talk about, my thoughts about Australia in my childhood, Australia Day and Australia now and in the future. Australia Day was only recognised by all states as a national day in 1935 and that was the year I was born. It wasn't declared a public holiday across Australia until 1994. So as a kid growing up in Canberra actually to begin with and then other parts, uh, there was there were really no celebrations of Australia Day. I do remember though that Australia was generally what we celebrated as now being an egalitarian society. The concept of a fair go for everyone was widespread. And the divisions between rich and poor were amongst the most reasonable in the world. But this was also the era of the white Australia policies. And people of different ethnicities and colours were much more marked, the, the, uh, the prejudices against them were much more marked than they are now. So Australia now, even though those prejudices and lack of tolerance still exist, we've, we've still come a long way and become a truly multinational, multicultural society. One of the, we're recognised as amongst the most multicultural societies in the world, more so, for example, and depending on how they measure multiculturalism, we're always in the top ten. And overall, I feel that we are much more tolerant now. The, the sad comment, though, is that in the decades since my childhood, the divisions between rich and poor have grown, with many equalities getting worse and not better. So I'd like to think that we can engineer some sort of a return to more egalitarian statistics. 
in the process, we've got to hang on firmly to the Australian ideal of the fair go. It might be a cliche, but it's a very powerful cliche. And we all, our politicians more than anyone, have to work towards and legislate for the preservation of these egalitarian standards that we now see under increasing threat of erosion, not only in Australia, but around the world. And in, that, in the, the growing gap between rich and poor, for example. And I'm not sure that our politicians are really up to it, but it's definitely not a development that we want to see here. Nevertheless, Australia Day can provide a focus on all of the good aspects of our society and on the development of a truly inspiring vision for our future. So what about Australia and Australia Day in the future? Well, I'd like to bend your ears just a little bit uh, with just a little bit of recent history and then some, some future gazing. The history bit, well, it's not all that far back, 1949 to 1974, 25 years. The Snowy Mountain Scheme, the biggest engineering project in Australia's history providing clean, clean hydroelectric power for scores of cities and towns throughout New South Wales, Victoria, the ACT, Queensland and South Australia. It's widely recognised as the birthplace of multiculturalism in Australia, the Snowy Mountain Scheme. Over 100,000 workers, two-thirds of them migrants from over 30 countries, including Australia, Britain, all of Western, Eastern and Central Europe, Greece and Turkey, as well as Russia and the United States. They worked on the project and they brought with them new ideas, new customs, new cuisines, and they changed the very foundation of Australian society for the better. It cost 800 to 900 million dollars, about six billion dollars in today's money. And that's, that's well within the reach of governments and corporations now. And this wasn't something that was done for us by Britain or the United States. We did it ourselves. And we can do it again. Not the Snowy Mountain Scheme, of course, but big projects. Visionary projects that'll pick us up and carry us towards, forward, carry us forward dynamically into the 21st century and beyond. Maybe I should say beyond 2000. But here's a thought. There's a lot of talk about going to Mars and taming it making it Earth-like and livable for humans. And I'm not against that. It would be a huge visionary step for humankind. But doing creative stuff on Mars is vastly more difficult than doing creative stuff in the Australian deserts, for example. The centre of Australia is really just, just like another planet. It's waiting out there for us to do something about it. We're scratching at the edges, just thinking about mineral resources and oil and that sort of thing. But what about the fact that every day out there, a kilowatt of solar energy falls on every single square metre of land? And that sort of solar energy is being tapped by countries all around the world now on a vast and growing and increasingly economic and profitable scale. We're beginning to do it here, but on such a small scale. And yet, we have the best country in the world to harvest solar energy. So let's get something the size of the Snowy Mountain Scheme, or bigger, underway. For example, China's just opened up an 850 megawatt solar power station, the biggest in the world. 25 square kilometres of solar panels, enough to supply almost a million homes. And it's just one of many large plants underway there. And yet, 25 square kilometres is just one drop in a vast bucket in the Australian outback with huge joint government and private enterprise projects to open up our central desert, this sort of, uh, to this sort of enterprise, it, you could see road and rail infrastructure, links across the continent to join up with the Darwin to Alice Spring and road and rail lines, new towns and settlements emerging, power grids serving every state and territory. And the whole thing could be worked on much the same basis as the Snowy Mountain Scheme. We could open it up to migrant workers, just as we did with the immigrants uh, who worked on the snowy. They couldn't speak or read English, but they very soon did. And we could say to immigrants waiting to come here, okay, you can come in and settle, but you have to work 
for two years on this big project in the outback. Just like we do now with overseas doctors and teachers. They have to spend time working in rural and outback areas before they can work in cities and towns. It's much the same idea. And in this whole process, we get vast new energy supplies, hugely expanded infrastructure in the centre of our continent. And I'm sure we'd solve at the same time a lot of the problems around our immigration situation. But equally, if not more importantly, if the whole thing was handled properly, it could be of enormous benefit to the indigenous people in the outback and central Australia. Simple, really. <laughs> No, all jokes aside, and although people I'm sure will be able to pick holes in this concept, the bottom line of my message though is that in the 21st century, if we want to survive, if Australia wants to survive and prosper as a nation, we've got to think in visionary terms. We've got to develop visionary programs that could guide Australia towards a fantastic 21st century future. We've got to start thinking big, really big, B-I-G, and yes, we can. Thank you.